Hey y'all, welcome and welcome back. So today we are going to be doing a movie review for the live action Monster High movie that recently came out. This is the first time I've ever attempted to make a video quite like this, so bear with me if it's not the most organized or like the most well done. It's definitely not my usual territory, but I thought it would be fun and I had opinions, so like obviously that means that I have to share them. With this video in particular though, I have like a whole host of disclaimers that I have to get through. The first one is that I do have my laptop down on the ground here next to me. So I have like a whole bunch of notes on there of stuff that I want to talk about so that I don't forget to talk about anything. So if you happen to see me glancing down, that's why I'm going to try to not have to use that as much as possible so that this is like a more cohesive and nicer like to look at sort of video. Um, but yeah, if you do catch me doing that, that is why. Next disclaimer that I have to get out of the way is that this is only my opinions, which means two things this time. Uh, it does mean that if you disagree with me, that is totally okay. I'm not like trying to attack anybody personally. I'm just giving you my thoughts. And I obviously would love to hear all of your thoughts down in the comments down below. But the other thing that goes with that is that I have avoided watching any like real full length movie review for this movie until after I filmed this video. I wanted to make sure that everything that I was saying was fully my own thought and not just like what I was repeating off of somebody else or something that was influenced from somebody else. I have been unable to avoid seeing like little bits and bobs about people's opinions on TikTok because I'm chronically on TikTok and so I can't just like completely avoid it. But I haven't seen any like full full length reviews or any really in-depth reviews. I'm actually very excited to be able to watch all of those videos after filming this. But yeah, this is all just like my own thoughts and opinions. And then the other disclaimers, we're almost done, I promise, are that I'm not going to be using any clips or anything from the movie because, frankly, copyright scares me. I know that there is, like, fair use and ways that you can use these things, but I've talked about it in the past that I'm, like, afraid to use anything other than stock photos for dolls because I don't want to get copyright claimed or have my video taken down or anything like that. And especially with a movie, I'm just not going to risk it, so I'm sorry. You can, like, put this on in the background if you don't want to stare at my face the whole time that we're talking about this, if you just want to listen. But yeah, I'm not going to be including any clips just because I'm afraid. Uh, <laughs> and then the last thing is that this is going to be a review kind of full of spoilers. I don't know how in-depth I'm going to be talking about everything, but frankly, I have no idea how to discuss the movie without going into spoilers. So if you haven't seen it and you do intend to see it, uh, maybe wait to watch this video, you know, if you can like save it to your watch later and come back to it because I will be talking like openly about things that happen in the movie. I'm not going to like try to work around that because I just think it's going to make it harder for me to express myself. So yeah, spoilers. Um, that's the warning here. So please don't be upset if I spoil anything for you. So that should be all of the disclaimers that I have to get through. Like I said, there were a lot this time, so I'm really, really sorry. Uh, but now we can actually get into it. So the first thing that I want to talk about is the character design. I wanted to talk about this first because it's something that we got kind of before the movie even actually came out. Obviously we could see it in the trailer and then also on the promo photos that were posted to Instagram. The <laughs> character design definitely got um, pretty harsh commentary from a lot of people back when it was first like released on Instagram, but I honestly don't think that it's terrible in every aspect. I'm not going to go in depth on every single character, I'm just going to kind of like talk about the ones that made me have a feeling good or bad first one is claudine i don't have a problem with the majority of her design really just like the ears i feel like are a little bit too high on top of her head they're not quite natural looking to me um this movie did have you can tell by some of the special effects and cgi not the highest budget ever so i think that that might be part of it but that's pretty much my only complaint with claudine it's just that the ears don't feel quite right. It's not something to the point where it like distracted me from my viewing experience and I couldn't enjoy it. But that was just my first thought upon seeing her on screen for the first time was that the ears are kind of off. With Deuce, I have a pro and a con. I really, really loved the way that they did his makeup in this movie. I think the orange that was kind of like done around his eyes really, really, really made his green hair and his green eyes pop. And that was really awesome. However, I don't like the fact that he had the green hair, hair specifically. He has hair and then snakes like mixed in. So for like 90% of the movie, you just see him with this beanie on with a little bit of green hair poking out. And I don't mind that. Like that, he just looks like a dude, right? But the snakes, I think mixing with the hair, again, I don't know if this is a CGI issue or just a concept issue. I wasn't really a big fan. I think I would have preferred if he just had a full head of snakes and like hit it completely behind the beanie. I don't really know. I just wasn't a huge fan of how that was executed. 
Um, Cleo, I actually really liked a lot of her designs, specifically hers. I found a lot of pieces that I thought would translate very well into doll clothing. There was one mesh top that I'm specifically thinking of that just like was long sleeve, went all the way down her arms and was so well blended into her skin tone that it just looked like she was glittering. And I loved it. I would love to see that on a doll. I thought it was so pretty, but Cleo's were some of like my underrated favorites, I think. <laughs> and then lastly was Frankie. I know especially the promo photo image for Frankie, people were not happy with the costume design for them. And I didn't think it was that bad. I think that probably the promo photo was my least favorite outfit that they wore in the movie. But overall, I honestly liked a lot of their clothes and a lot of their outfits and pieces. So I don't know if that means that the design isn't as bad as people were making it out to be, or if it just means that I have horrendous taste. Um, but there is that. <laughs> I will say that I think the background characters were pretty bad. Um, and I'm talking like, extras in the background that are not like official Monster High characters. They're just kind of filler characters to make the school look more crowded. It really just felt like Party City or like a party supply store kind of threw up on these characters in a lot of cases. A lot of clashing colors, no real like design elements. I don't know. It was very bizarre to me and that was definitely my least favorite part of the character design aspect is I just think that the extras did not look good pretty much ever. Um, so that's my biggest complaint there. In general, though, I do want to put forward a theory to you guys. I think that part of the reason that people are not a fan of the like fashion and the clothing designs or the costume design for this movie is because it doesn't translate well from doll form. So here's what I mean by that <laughs> is when you have a doll, let's say Claudine, and she's got all of these crazy like fur prints and animal prints and like moons everywhere. It makes sense on a doll because that's like a full artistic interpretation and the doll itself is molded to work with the clothes. Same thing with the old webisodes of Monster High and the old um, movies and now the new animation where that's all animated in some way, right? So you can create it and draw it and animate it to where it all feels cohesive. Whereas when you're trying to dress a person to look like Claudine, you can't change the person past a certain extent, right? Especially with the budget that they're working for. Like you have this human being who looks like they look and you can dress them up in Claudine's clothes, but you can't completely redesign how that person looks to make a cohesive image. So I think that it's kind of a problem of translating from one media type to another media type where it might look better when you can literally design from head to toe the whole thing a cartoon or a doll of this character versus when you're trying to dress a human up to look like this character. I also don't think that it helps that the prints scale up, obviously, to go from doll form to human form, and things tend to look a little bit cuter when they're in miniature, um, so I think that's also a problem. But yeah, I think it's just like a different media type kind of being an issue there. I kind of liken it to when the live-action Lion King came out. Obviously, the CGI in that was leagues ahead of the CGI in Monster High. It looked phenomenal from that standpoint in the sense that it looked very realistic but because it looked so realistic you lost a lot of the expression and therefore a lot of the heart that the original Lion King had because the cartoon you can draw the faces in a slightly less realistic way to get more expression that comes across. Obviously in that instance we're talking expression whereas with Monster High I'm talking design but I think that they do kind of coincide in the sense that there's just something different about the art of making a live action movie where something has always been a cartoon or a doll before that it might not translate quite as well. So like the too long didn't watch of that theory is just that I think that the costumes aren't necessarily inherently designed poorly. I think that's just the nature of translating it from this completely artistic world to now a semi-real world that it doesn't quite translate the same. So I would definitely be interested to hear what you guys think about that theory. I literally thought about that laying in bed one night. I was like, hold on, I have to put this in the video. <laughs> but yeah, I would, I would love to hear your thoughts on that and the rest of the character design aspects I talked about. Okay, we are finally getting into what is arguably supposed to be the main point of a movie, which is the plot. Funnily enough, this is probably what I have the least to say about. I think it is a basic plot. You know, if you go into this thinking that it's going to be some cinematic masterpiece, it's probably not. Um, it's just kind of the classic story of teenage girl enters her new life phase and a new environment and has this problem, but meets friends and meets a cute guy and has a hiccup on the road to her happy ending, but gets a happy ending anyway, right? And there's a reason that that story has been told over and over and over and will continue to be told over and over and over. And it's because it's a good baseline plot 
for something that especially younger people can relate to. It resonates with people. So it's not bad at all. I don't want to criticize the movie for having a more basic plot because I don't think that basic has to mean bad. But also in all fairness, it's not super intense. It's not super crazy. It's not particularly unpredictable or anything like that. It's just kind of an average plot. My big takeaway is that I think in general, a lot of aspects of the movie would have benefited from having a lot more screen time. Um, a lot of the characters don't really have a ton of time on screen, especially like Laguna is in for a couple scenes and I think has like one line in the entire movie. So she's not really fleshed out, you know, and a lot of characters aren't given the opportunity to really have a plot within like their own arc. So I think if it had a lot more runtime, that could have been fleshed out more and would have been more interesting to watch. I also think like some concept like the school is alive in this canon of Monster High. And I think that's so fascinating, but they don't really do a ton with it. And I think that if given the opportunity to give that more attention, that would have been awesome. But like, I do understand that you can only make a movie so long before it becomes unbearable. And this was not going to be like an MCU type movie where it's just like hours and hours of sitting there, right? So I understand why it's not, but I do think that that definitely prohibited the plot from being like better than just basic, if that makes sense. The only thing that I have like a personal weigh in on is the uh, Claudine and Deuce thing in this movie. And now that I'm saying that, I realized I did forget one spoiler or one disclaimer at the beginning of this video. Um, this is my first piece of Monster High media I've ever consumed. So I'm not really looking at this from like a super nostalgic lens necessarily. Obviously I liked the old Monster High dolls, but I never watched the movies or webisodes. So I don't have any frame of reference for how these characters acted in the original rendition of Monster High. I know the personalities changed in some instances and some people are very unhappy about that. And I do get it that like, if you have this character that you've come to know and love, you might feel uncomfortable with them being represented in a different way in terms of their personality. I don't have that. So in most instances, I'm looking at this from a pretty objective viewpoint, I would think. Um, but this particular one, the Claudine and Deuce thing, I definitely prefer Cleo and Deuce. I don't know what it is because like I said, I've never seen the show or the movies, so I don't have like that vested interest in it. But even just from the dolls, I thought that they made a very, very cute couple. That being said, I maintain, as I've said a few times regarding uh, Monster High Generation 3 and all of therefore the media that comes with it, that just because it's different does not mean that it has to be inherently bad. You can definitely not like it because you had such a good experience with the original animation, but that doesn't mean that this is terrible like they can both be good just for different people so if I try to look at it objectively regarding Deuce and his romantic partners I definitely prefer Cleo and Deuce however in the movie Claudine and Deuce definitely have some chemistry they can connect on certain issues and like they can support each other in that way and they didn't do anything wrong like it's not a weird relationship if I take away the fact that I knew that Deuce and Cleo used to be really really cute together um, I wouldn't be upset by it if I was just like a kid watching this for the first time I would probably think that they're a cute couple so I guess the breakdown on that is that I personally don't love it just because I still want to see Cleo and Deuce um but I'm just gonna leave it at that and like I'm not going to really project that or complain about it because I don't think that's fair. I think this is a new generation for a new generation of kids and so like if they like Claudine and Deuce, I don't want to like rain on their parade for that, but that's just kind of my opinion on that. Okay, now we can get to some of like my actual favorite parts of the movie. And this is probably the thing that I think stood out the most to me was how well I feel like the three main characters represent really common struggles for kids. So starting with Draculaura, she is in this situation where her father has a lot of pressure that he's putting on her to get good grades and just be the best. And then not only that, but also all of her other family on Dracula's side is undead. So they're also all there putting on this pressure for her. And I know that's something that a lot of kids experience. And then adding on to that, the fact that she has interests that don't align with what Dracula wants for her, what his plan for her is. And so she feels like she can't express those interests or can't be supported in those interests because of that familial pressure. And I know for sure, I <laughs> definitely relate to this one. I know what it's like to feel that pressure to be the best or to have your family think, oh, you should do this instead of this. And it's hard. And I think that this was a really cool thing to see represented by Draculaura because it is so real. I know so 
many kids go through this and adults too. Like anytime that I mention kids being able to relate, just assume that adults can also relate. But I'm thinking specifically for the target audience of this movie. Like if you're in school and your parents really want you to play basketball, but you really want to be in theater. Yes, that was a high school musical reference now that I'm thinking about it. <laughs> but that's like a real struggle that people deal with where they might want to do one thing. They might want to go into art, whereas their parents might want them to be a doctor. And those are two conflicting things. And there's this big internal struggle of wanting to keep your family happy and wanting to have your parents be proud of you and wanting to do what really makes you happy. And so I think that it was awesome to see Draculaura represent that because it is so relatable. Obviously having a vampire family where all of your ancestors are there judging you isn't perfectly translated into real life, but I think it's a good blueprint for kids to be able to see their struggles within her and therefore relate. And of course, at the end of the movie, she's got like a happy ending and they all do. So to kind of give them that hope, I think is really, really nice. And then Frankie also dealt with something that I could relate to where they're literally 15, 16 days old at the beginning of this movie. That's not the part I can relate to, <laughs> but they have this kind of interesting dichotomy where because of how they were created, they are super intelligent. Like they're very smart. They're very aware of things, but they have no social experience whatsoever. And so they're trying to go into this situation of starting school, being so young and having all this knowledge, but not really knowing how to use it appropriately in a social setting and how to connect with their peers. And I just, I really get it. Um, I have always found it very hard to connect with people. I've always said that it feels to me like everyone else got like a rule book about how social settings are supposed to go and I never got my copy. And so I'm just trying to like figure it out based on trying to guess what clues other people are giving me. And it's very difficult, you know, like it's not fun. I think that Frankie's struggle in this movie is one that a lot of kids can relate to especially if they are like going to a new school for the first time, if they're like switching schools, that would be really hard. And I think that that would be very similar to what Frankie experiences. I also just from my personal experience, think this might be some decent representation of what it feels like to be neurodivergent, where you're around these people and you know that you can relate to them on some level, but also something about how you feel like you work doesn't fit into how they seem to work. I don't know if that makes sense, but I definitely resonated with it. And again, all the same things that I said about Draculaura's struggle is true here, where I think it's awesome to see that presented and then to see Frankie have a happy ending and kind of have their group of friends and also to like make up with Cleo, who they had beef with at the beginning of the movie. I think that was cool to see them be able to overcome that struggle and kind of like give kids who might be feeling a little bit lost or alone some hope. So I thought that was very beautiful. And then for Claudine, her struggle is kind of finding where you belong. This isn't something that I related to quite as much as I related to the other two characters, but I still think it's a very, very important message. Um, I think the overall topic of trying to find a place where you belong could be related to by a lot of people, but I especially think that Claudine's situation specifically where she doesn't quite fit in in the human world because of her monster half, but she can't be open about her human half in the monster world She's like got these two halves of her that are a bit of a dichotomy socially in the Monster High canon for this movie. And she's trying to figure out how to make that all work where it's all her, but she doesn't know how to be herself and where she's allowed to be herself. And obviously, again, I'm white, so I can't like perfectly speak to this, but I feel like that might be a really good representation of a struggle that mixed race kids might go through where they're like, quote unquote, heavy quotes there not black enough to be seen as part of the black community, but then also not white enough to be seen as a part of the white community. And just trying to find where you belong. Again, I don't know personally, so like, let me know if I'm wrong, please let me know if I'm wrong. But I would think that that's pretty good representation for that kind of struggle. Or even beyond race, just thinking kids who have parents who are divorced maybe, where they have kind of two separate lives within the two separate households that they're now a part of. Or if you move drastically, when you're young, like say you are born in Taiwan and you live your whole childhood there, but then in your teens, you move to America. And so during some core formative parts of your life, you're in two very, very different cultures. You might not know where you belong because you grew up in Taiwan and that's a huge part of you, but then you also grew up in America and that's also a huge part of you. And overall, I just think that again, it's not something that I can really relate to, but I could see a lot of people from different situations than myself identifying to Claudine a lot. And I liked seeing that. I liked actually that I didn't kind of resonate with her because I could still appreciate her character, obviously, but I like that 
I could physically see, okay, yeah, I relate to Dracula and Frankie, but I don't really relate to Claudine. And I know that for some people that would be the opposite, where maybe they relate to Claudine and Dracula, but not Frankie. And so I think that's a good sign that there's a lot of different people who might be able to see themselves within these three main characters and kind of see their struggles be represented and be taken on by a really cool character and then be like solved. I don't know. Overall, I just think that the movie did a really, really good job of showing very common issues that people face in a more like fantastical way to fit the world of Monster High. Kind of jumping off of the struggles that these characters represent, I did want to talk about their personalities and just my thoughts on that. I loved that Dracula is actually quite cold at first. Um, she doesn't really want to have anything to do with her new roommates. And I think that's very appropriate for someone who is forced continually to keep their passion secret and where they just don't feel safe sharing with people. Again, that's something that I can relate to where it's almost that you don't know who is safe for you to talk to because you know that your interests have been looked down upon. And so while it was kind of jarring to see her be so rude at first, I thought it was very thematically appropriate. And then to see her open up and become more supportive of her friends and more connected with her friends throughout the movie, I thought was really, really awesome to see. Claudine I really liked because while she's in this incredible, vulnerable state, like she's honestly so unsure of herself throughout a lot of the movie, f trying to find, like I just discussed, where she belongs, she still has such a strength about her that I found very interesting and very cool. Most notably, I think when she stands up to Cleo, it's like Claudine doesn't even know whether she belongs in this world yet or whether she can safely exist within this world and is trying to find a way to make it okay for her to be there. But she still has the internal strength to tell Cleo to be nicer. I just loved that. I thought that that was really cool that she could be in such a state where like she could be kind of shrinking back into herself and she still was willing to stand up for people around her. I loved that about Claudine. Cleo didn't have as much screen time as some of the other characters, but there was one throwaway line that I wanted to talk about because I just found it very interesting. I think it was Deuce that said that she has a bad attitude because she has been wrapped in linens for a thousand years. And I thought it was just such an interesting thing. It's such a small line. I don't know why I latched onto it, but I thought it was really cool because it definitely is in a very, very small way, an exploration of the idea that you can definitely explain someone's behavior and therefore maybe be able to judge whether you should like reach out a helping hand or be more sympathetic to them without excusing it. Deuce, I think it was Deuce, uh, wasn't saying it's okay that Cleo is being so rude and so mean to the other characters, but just kind of giving a background for what she's been through that might have led her to be this way. So I don't know, it was like literally one line in the movie, but I thought it actually had kind of a deep meaning. So I did want to talk about that. And then as far as Deuce goes, throughout the whole movie, he's basically just like a super chill dude. There are tinges of this idea that because he's a Gorgon, he's seen as maybe more of an unruly monster who might not be as trustworthy as other kinds of monsters. And I thought that was a really interesting concept. And again, that's part that I would have loved to have seen more screen time be given to because I think this idea of basically like a type of monster racism would have been very interesting to explore. And then therefore, like within the context of a movie, they're going to solve it, right? Solve on screen. I think that would have been really cool. Um, but most of the time in the movie, he's just like a chill, likable guy. I don't have a ton to say about him. And then lastly was Frankie, who was so funny to me. I am going to talk a little bit about how funny this movie was later, but... I thought that they were so hilarious. I loved every second that they were on screen. I feel like they had just such a great energy about them. And I didn't expect that going in. I have said um, before on the channel that I've never been like a huge Frankie fan. Frankie never really resonated with me. Obviously before it was just the dolls. Um, but yeah, for this generation watching the movie, I think Frankie was unquestionably my favorite character. So that was just like a very fun surprise for me. Okay, that was the positive stuff. I did want to talk about a couple of criticisms that have been levied at this movie. I want to preface this by saying I'm not saying that you can't criticize this movie for valid reasons. I'm not trying to say that this movie is 100% perfect. Um, I know that's not true. No piece of media is 100% perfect. But I just thought that these were some criticisms that I would kind of like to counter argue. Inherently, I like to debate. So like, again, this isn't personal. I just, I like to, you know, play like devil's advocate. I don't think I'm really doing that in this case, but I like to debate. So I wanted to talk about these. The first thing is that I know probably all of you guys have seen this. A lot of people are taking issue with the way that Frankie introduces themselves where they go, Frankie, I'm non-binary, my pronouns are they, them, saying that it's quite forward and like, quote unquote, no one would ever say that. First of all, I want to say from personal experience, I feel so 
unbelievably safe when people do that. When people introduce themselves to me with their pronouns, I immediately feel more comfortable sharing my own and I don't feel like I'm going to be judged for sharing my own. And so when I talk to someone for the first time and that's how they introduce themselves, it creates this little bubble of safe space where I feel less anxious meeting them, especially as someone with social anxiety. It just makes me feel so much better. So even though it might not be like quote unquote normal in all settings, I wish that it was because it feels awesome to just like have that initial positive interaction with somebody. But then regarding it being normal, I have seen a few people on TikTok say that actually, especially in school settings, especially in college settings, at least here in the US, that is normal. Like that's how your professors will ask you to introduce yourself to the class. So given that Frankie is literally at Monster High, a school, I think it's very appropriate. Even within the context of the movie, Claudine isn't surprised by this. She doesn't act like it's weird when Frankie introduces themselves this way. So clearly within the canon of the movie, that's like a normal, acceptable thing to do. And basically, I just don't see why people have a problem with that because I don't think that it's weird to tell people when you first meet them, hey, I'd appreciate it if you use these pronouns. It's like just letting people know so that they don't accidentally misgender you. And it just seems like a little bit of courtesy. I don't know, like, like I know it's not normal everywhere because I don't experience it everywhere, but I do like when I experience it and I don't think it's a bad thing to experience it. So for Frankie to kind of set that example for younger people watching this movie, I don't think is a problem at all. And then the other thing with Frankie that I've seen people criticize is that their kind of set of knowledge doesn't make sense. Specifically, I've seen people say that it doesn't make sense for Frankie to know that they are non-binary but not know what a high five is. First of all, I'd like to point out that it seems a lot of the criticisms about Frankie center around them being non-binary, which I do not think is a coincidence. But also the movie literally <laughs> explains this in one of my favorite parts because I just thought it was so funny. Um, when Frankie and Claudine first meet, Frankie rattles off a long list of werewolf facts about like, the word werewolf and everything. And when they're done, Claudine goes, I didn't know any of that. And Frankie goes, I didn't know I knew any of that because they literally have just different parts of different people's brains compiled together into one brain for them. So they, in the canon of the movie, don't even know what knowledge they possess until suddenly it like clicks in their head and they have it. So it, like it makes perfect sense that Frankie would have kind of imbalanced understanding where they might know some things and not know others. And then also with the intelligence that Frankie has, I think that it makes sense if they've spent the first 15 days of their life like alone with their parents, they would know something about themselves, about their own identity being non-binary, but not know something that is only really learned in a social setting, which is what a high five is. Basically, I think that this issue that people have is more of a problem with Frankie being non-binary that is very thinly veiled as that problem. Um, I don't think it's actually an issue of them thinking that they have uneven knowledge. I think it's just they don't like that they're not binary. But that's just my opinion. Don't come for me on that. But I, I don't think that that's like a valid criticism. And then this last thing is much lower stakes. <laughs> but uh, I have seen people complain about the clip in the trailer of Laguna's only line that like actually made it into the movie where her and Cleo are reunited after the summer and she finds out that Cleo and Deuce have broken up. So she offers to eat Deuce and then bears her huge fangs at him. And I think part of this does tie into the fact that it seems as though Wave 1 Laguna, or not Wave 1 Laguna, Gen 1 Laguna had a more gentle personality. Again, I don't know that for sure because I've never seen the media and people aren't happy with her aggression in this one. I can't really judge Laguna's personality because I didn't get to see a lot of Laguna's personality. But all I have to say about this in particular, and again, this is a lot more lighthearted and just kind of like a funny thing to me, not as serious as the Frankie issues. But I think it's funny because honestly, we all want a best friend like that. Like, let's be honest, we all need the best friend who when you have a breakup is like, do you want me to go slash their tires? <laughs> like, not actually. Um, I don't condone that. Like, don't go slashing tires. Don't injure people. Like, I'm not saying that's something you should actually do but the friend who will offer it in a joking way to do that for you is like a ride or die friend so i think from the one line that she had laguna seemed like a very good friend to cleo so again not serious but like i just wanted to point that out we are almost done this is just a few random things that i wanted to point out about the movie um the first is that the songs absolutely are a bop i knew from the trailer that out of the dark was pretty good but hearing it in the movie i actually really really enjoyed it and all of the other songs following that were not like quite as good, but were also still 
really enjoyable overall. So I was surprised by how much I liked the songs. On the other hand, yeah, the CGI isn't the best. It is not the worst that I've ever seen, for sure, but it's not the best. I don't think it was something that distracted you from enjoying the movie entirely, but like, if you are a big graphics person, it probably is not going to be enjoyable for you. I also have to talk about the fact that Heath and Abby had literally one scene together that was maybe 10 seconds long, and it's where Heath is teaching her how to play football with a real foot. And first of all, that's a hilarious joke. But second of all, I thought it was very interesting because I have never had a vested interest in Heath and Abby being together. But that one scene, that one 10 second scene, I felt like they had such cute chemistry that immediately I was into it. So I don't know if that was intentional on the movie's part, but it worked. So I just wanted to say that. And then lastly, this movie is so funny. <laughs> I kept a tally of how many times I literally had to stop the movie because I was laughing so hard that I couldn't hear what was happening next. And it was four times. And that's just the times that I had to pause the movie because I was laughing so hard. There were plenty of other times that I laughed aloud or gave like a little chuckle. I did not expect this movie to be as funny as it was, but it genuinely was so hilarious to me that that alone was enough reason for me to like it. I love like comedy. I love funny people. I like to think that I'm a very funny person. So that was like a 10 out of 10 um, awesome experience, like comedy wise for me. And then the last section that I wanted to talk about here was I have two questions. I don't know if these are plot holes or if you guys will be able to answer these questions for me in the comments, but I just, I need to know. Okay. So first of all, it's Claudine. Claudine has big fat wolf ears and like long nails and eyes that are like slightly less monstrous, but she has very monstrous qualities, especially in the ears. Right. And when we are introduced to her, she is literally running away from a group of kids who saw her ears. Her ears were like revealed from underneath her hood and they're chasing her being like, what is that? Like, what is that thing? And it's her 15th birthday. <laughs> and she's like, presumably had these features her whole life, right? Like you literally learn later on that half human, half monster hybrids will start to display human characteristics during pubescence only in times of extreme stress. And the first time that this happens to Claudine, she's shocked and surprised. So I think it's safe to assume that Claudine has always looked like her more monstrous self. So my question is how in the world does she go 15 years in the human world without being exposed? Like her hood fell down while she was skateboarding and a bunch of kids saw her. And like, I can't believe that that hasn't happened before, right? Especially when she's younger, like in kindergarten, you telling me that a kid who's like five or six is going to remember to cover their ears the whole time that they're there. I don't know. I just, I have questions about how she has not been exposed already. And then my second question is regarding Frankie's parents. So Frankie is an amalgamation of parts of like human corpses that have been sewn together and create like a new person. There's no question in my mind that Frankie is a monster in that regard. However, Frankie says that their parents are mad scientists. I'm going to go off on a tangent here for a second. <laughs> but within the context of the movie, witchcraft is something practiced by humans, which inherently means that witches are humans who practice witchcraft, right? Witches are not monsters in this Monster High movie universe. It's even established that vampires and witches are kind of at war with each other, and it ties into this whole monsters versus humans thing. And then we literally have like the overarching theme of the movie be the fact that Claudine can't be open about her human half because humans are so reviled at Monster High. The monster world sees humans as a threat and humans are hated. And if you are known to be half human, you're not allowed there. There's literally a song about how humans are trash and monsters are way better than them. So with that, are mad scientists not human? <laughs> like, are they a type of monster and it's not just discussed? Like, are these werewolf mad scientists? I have so many questions about this because Claudine can't mention that her dad is a human because she will be denied on her application to Monster High, even though she is definitely part monster. Frankie's a monster, but I would assume that if their parents were human, they couldn't mention them on their application because their parents are human. So like, what's the thing here? Why would mad scientists be able to have a kid who goes to Monster High, but like witches are not monstrous enough to be allowed there? I'm so confused about this. I need to know what the like monster status is of Frankie's parents. I feel like that's such a weird thing to get hung up on. And I know it doesn't actually matter, but I was thinking that the entire time watching this movie, I was like, are Frankie's parents human? And then also Frankie gleefully sings along to that song about how monsters are better. So like if their parents are human, are they just trashing their parents? I don't know. I need answers in that regard. But 
that is finally everything that I have to talk about. Wow, uh, my throat's so dry because <laughs> I had so much to say. I hope I didn't forget anything. I don't think I did. But those are kind of all of my overarching thoughts on the Monster High movie. I would love to hear what you guys have to say in the comments down below. Um, I understand if there's a lot to say because this has been a long one. I, I have a lot to say. So like if you guys also do, I will read all of the long comments. But yeah, please do let me know what you're thinking. I would love to discuss this with you guys. And I hope you enjoyed the video. Um, if you did, if you could give it a like, that would mean a lot. If you haven't subscribed and you like the video, if you could subscribe. I make new videos every Monday and Thursday. I promise to keep you entertained. But yeah, I hope you guys have a lovely rest of your day or your night or whatever it might be. And I will catch you in the next one. Bye, guys.